Welcome to the latest in our series of anti-tank chats and this time we'll be talking about this weapon, the BAT, British Army's Italian anti-tank gun, 120mm recallless rifle. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. The story really starts with um, a very strange looking post-war vehicle, uh, the American M50 Ontos. Um, now, Ontos is Greek for thing, and this object, it, it's, a, it's a very odd looking two-man uh, track vehicle with 606 mm recalled rifles on top. It came out of something called Project Vista, uh, which is named after the Pasadena Hotel, uh, in which the initial meeting took place. This envisaged uh, Western Europe, um, the North German Plain, the Fulda Gap, places like that, being defended from the vast hordes of Warsaw Pact tanks by uh, minefields, infantry strong points, and small, cheap, expendable vehicles like the Ontos, fitted with the M40 recallless rifle. Although the recall this principle had been known for some time, but its military application really dates to just before the First World War and an American naval officer called Cleland Davis, and he came up with a concept for a recall this weapon. Now, the whole recall this idea is extremely useful because if there is no recall, the weapon doesn't need to be on a big heavy mount, it doesn't need recall cylinders, and that's a considerable advantage if you want to do something like mount it on an aircraft. And it should aid, because it's very lightweight, its portability. Davis achieved this by producing a weapon that used two propellant charges, which when detonated pushed the projectile in one direction, while an equal weight buckshot went down the other. It was rejected for ground use, but interestingly, it was adapted for use on aircraft. And the thought was it could be used against U-boats. It was experimentally suggested as something for hunting Zeppelins. The one thing here being though, that the pilot would need to make sure the buckshot charge didn't damage his aircraft. The Davis weapon these days is, is really remembered just as a curiosity. Um, but what was key to improving the recall this principle was work done by the German armaments manufacturer Krupp. Uh, the Krupp designers realised that you didn't need buckshot, you could actually use propellant gases because it didn't matter what came out of the rear of the weapon as long as the actual charge was balanced. And they were working to produce a lightweight gun that would fire a large calibre charge. So putting that very simply, the projectile goes one way and the propellant gas goes the other. The secret of this is something called venturi, which is a narrow section and that speeds up the gas before it's expelled through a cone-shaped funnel at the rear of the barrel. The second important element in the design was uh, the case itself. Now this needed to contain five times the propellant um, to the weight of round of a normal uh, weapon. The propellant gas needed to escape backwards, but the problem is that the propellant itself would not combust properly unless it's under pressure. So there's an opening at the rear, but that is closed temporarily with a Bakelite disc to enable the propellant to combust. When that bursts, propellant gas goes backwards, shell is kicked forwards, and the whole thing works. The Krupp design incorporated a lightweight carriage, a rear-based breech and the use of large caliber hollow charge shells which meant that it didn't compromise the low velocity of the gun itself. What this led to was the Leichtgeschutz LG40, a 7.5 centimeter lightweight infantry gun uh, which was used by German paratroops, mountain troops and it saw its combat debut in the invasion of Crete in 1941. The Krupp design set the standard for modern recallless rifles. For the British, the development of the recallless rifle was largely down to one man, Sir Charles Deniston Burney. 
Retiring from the Royal Navy as a commander, Bernie had worked on quite a number of projects, including the R100 airship. But he'd also begun to explore the possibilities of the Davis principle, independently of the Germans, starting off with a four-bore punt gun. By 1944, Bernie had moved from an initial 20 millimeter uh, weapon up to a larger 88 millimeter example. This weighed in at 75 pounds, um, which was viewed as being light enough uh, for a single soldier to handle. Although to judge by the images of the way they had to brace themselves under the weight of the thing, I'm not entirely sure that was true. The most innovative part of this design was the use of a large calibre high explosive shell to attack armour. This employed what would become known as the squash head principle. The shell impacts on the armour and the quantity of HE inside spreads and deforms before it's detonated by a base fuse. This sends a high velocity compressive shock wave travelling through the armour plate until it reaches the air on the other side. On contact with the air, the shockwave is reflected backwards and it meets more secondary shockwaves coming forwards. These then combine. It's this combined shockwave that then comes forward. It overmatches the strength of the armour plate and it detaches a large scab of metal from the interior. This detached scab uh, moves anything from 30 to 130 metres a second and it's between 25 and 50% bigger than the diameter of the Hesch warhead. The impact of the Hesch warhead had a massive concussive effect, smashing fittings inside the vehicle. And the impact of a 150 millimeter uh, metal scab whirling forward into the firelit compartment would have a hideous effect on the vehicle and its crew. By 1946, Bernie had designed a 120 millimetre recallless weapon and he was experimenting with the use of rocket assisted munitions and the Board of Ordnance had ordered 80 trial rounds for this. It was this design that was to become the basis for the 120 millimetre battalion anti-tank gun of 1950. The main improvements adopted the use of the Krupp single venturi on breech block and a plastic bursting disc in the base of the cartridge. Entering service in 1953, the first L1 120mm bats were somewhat on the heavy side. I mean, they weighed in well over a thousand kilograms, but that's still a third of the weight of the 17 pounder anti tank gun they were replacing. And they had a lower profile, even with a protective gun shield. Under a thousand kilograms is still quite a little weight and they were quite a handful for a three-man crew to handle. Concerns with the weight of the bat led to the introduction of the L2 modified bat, the MOBAT. Now this lost the shield and traversing gear and it managed to reduce the weight by about a quarter and that enabled the gun to be towed behind a Land Rover. We're fortunate here in that we've got examples of three different uh, weapons from the bat series. We have Wombat, Mobat, and then this one, this is the L7 Combat, and this is an upgrade from earlier weapons. Essentially what you've got here are five different components. Barrel, mounts for the ranging gun, sighting gear, the carriage, and then down at the back end, obviously that is the breech. Starting at the front, business end, uh, there is a towing eye, and then a pair of handles to enable the crew to move the weapon around. And then as you come down the barrel, it's really difficult to see, but there's actually something I, really, I very much like here. There's an engraved royal crest with the cipher of our late Queen Elizabeth II. And that's something they were doing in Tudor time. So I'm really it's really nice to see that's carried on. Just behind that, these are the mounts for the L40A1 ranging gun. Now what that was, was an M8 um, US manufactured semi-automatic rifle with a magazine of 20 tracer rounds. That is an effective ranging tool because out to 350 meters, those tracer rounds, and obviously you can see them in flight, uh, will follow the same trajectory as the Hesch round when you fire it. 
it was better than what came before, certainly, which was a Bren gun, which was actually mounted on a bracket on this side. The 303 rounds from the Bren didn't follow the same trajectory, so it really didn't do the job quite as well. Here on the right-hand side of the weapon, we have the gunner's position, and this is the arm to which the sighting apparatus will be fitted. Uh, so you have an iron sight here for uh, course aiming, and then there's a bracket for a telescopic sight. Now, we don't unfortunately have one of these, but the L6 Wombat would have been fitted with the uh, number 75 sight, which is three times magnification, and that would enable the gunner to engage a moving target up to about 1,350 metres and a stationary target out to 2,000. Running through the gunnery controls, down here is the elevation wheel. That will give the gunner up to 17 degrees of elevation and 8 degrees of depression. Now the traverse gear has been removed, so that's free running, and that is a free 360 degree traverse. Just here, this is the, these are the firing controls, and there is a cable operated trigger, which I've got my thumb on. Uh, that would fire around from the ranging gun. And then you've got the safety catch, just here, just turn it around onto fire. And this is the firing button. And when you press that, the Hesh round goes down the barrel. Looking at the breech, uh, it is a vertically operating breech and you can open it from either side uh, using these levers. What you need to do is depress the lever plunger and then pull the lever backwards and that actually drops the breech block down. With the breech open, the loader will take this massively heavy, it's a one piece round, it weighs over 60 pounds, lay that down uh, on the tray here, push it forward into the breech and then close the breech by pushing the levers forward. When the weapon's fired, the Hesh round will travel to the target at around about 462 meters a second. With the use of the spotting gun, it's really very accurate, and the rate of fire is four to five rounds a minute. The crew obviously had to be mindful of the huge back blast. That would be extremely dangerous and it would also tend to give the position of the gun away. The weapon, as you see, is in towing mode, so that means the traverse gear is locked, so the barrel won't swing around. Uh, you've got a pair of quite meaty uh, cross-country pneumatic tyres for ease of towing, and then a pair of handbrakes, one on either side. Looking at the ammunition, this is a sectioned training uh, bat Hesh round, 120mm, um, and coming forward from the back, you've got the uh, base fuse here. That's designed to detonate at the optimum moment on impact of the target, and that will set off this red material, which is the high explosive. Now, the whole thing about this is the round needs to hit the target, and the squash head effect comes into play. So the front, this area here, is noticeably thinner. That's to allow the round to impact on the target, and for the high explosive to spread before detonation. It's important that the high explosive uh, is insensitive enough not to burn through prematurely on impact with the target before the base fuse can detonate. Uh, that would cause what's called reverse impact detonation and the shockwave would flow away from the target rather than achieving the Hesh effect. Um, it's further assured by the fact we've got an inert black filling in the nose of the shell, that absorbs some of the impact and it makes sure that the explosive will spread correctly. The last iteration of the 120mm L6 BAT series arrived in service in 1964. The weapon of magnesium, the Wombat. I think that's a pretty convoluted acronym, if I'm honest. Um, and I do wonder whether somebody had uh, a thing about Australian marsupials. But as the weapon ended up being used by the Australian Army, I suppose there may be a link. The weapon used lightweight magnesium alloy in the carriage and high-grade steel in the barrel. And this reduces the total weight by up to 65% to a very svelte 295 kilograms. Dimensionally, the Wombat also shows this reduction. Uh, it shrinks in width to 85 centimetres and the height is dropped by reducing the 
wheels by 23 centimetres in diameter. It was also fitted with a new circular ring locking breech which swings open to the right. The reason for this reduction was to enable the Wombat to be portly mounted on a long wheelbase Land Rover. Now, the thinking behind this is the infantry were getting increasingly aware of the threats of the nuclear battlefield. Having a weapon towed behind you would slow you up to a considerable degree. Another solution came from the Infantry Trials and Development Unit, who by 1967 had come up with a simple six bolt mount so that the Wombat could be fitted to an FV-432 armoured personnel carrier. The FV-432 could carry 12 rounds, uh, the Porty uh, mounted Land Rover could carry six. The typical organisation of an infantry anti-tank platoon was six Wombats in three sections. Before this mounted capability, infantry bat teams were trained to fire from prepared gun positions, from gun pits. Uh, but by the late 1970s, 1980s, things are changing and the Wombat is becoming obsolete. We're getting the introduction of uh, recallless short-range anti-tank weapons like the Carl Gustav and also wire-guided anti-tank missiles. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe or if you can, support us on Patreon. And we look forward to seeing you at Tankfest.